Is it, am I, am I doing the thing? I'm doing the thing. Um, geez, that intro like really aggressively oversold me. Um, oh, there I am. That's my intro slide. Don't look at that yet. Okay, so, uh, okay, actually, you know what, before we do anything, I've actually been in Wellington all week and I have really uh, gotten to a backstage look at how much goes into putting together an event like this. And these organizers are absolutely amazing. I'm also literally living in Erica's actual home right now. And like, we like did not know each other before I am an internet stranger. So if you're wondering like what lengths they're going to to make this happen, uh, and, and it's also, I mean, like I slept next to these crafts, like her whole life is besides right now. So, um, like, let's give them a round of applause because they are killing it. And this is awesome. And let's also be, uh, really gentle with them today and tomorrow because they are very sleepy. So, um, getting down to business, I thought a lot about how I wanted to introduce myself. I settled on this picture, you got the preview. Uh, you know, it's just, it's 9 a.m., like, no one has time for a resume recap right now. Um, but I really did like this one shot of me recently, um, uh, furniture shopping with a just debilitating sinus infection. And I do have this up if you want to get closer to the sinuses. If you are someone who takes pictures during presentations, this really would be a good time. I'm gonna just throw my Twitter handle up there, so uh, definitely tag me. And while you're getting out your phone, I'll just mention, I am on the internal security team at Rapid7 over in Boston, Massachusetts, so pretty far. This is my first time here. Guys, New Zealand is so dope. <laughs> like, <laughs> 10 out of 10. Um, I started as a security analyst at Rapid7, and my brand new title is Manager of Trust and Security Governance. I had to look at my notes because I still don't know what my title is. It's too many words. So. We all know that we are at, that's exactly how it happens, are you kidding? Do you guys not go to board meetings? Um, we're at a really exciting time for InfoSec right now. We're in the boardroom. Uh, some of us are even getting the resources we need to do our jobs correctly. It feels pretty revolutionary. I'm just like, I don't know, do you guys know George Washington? Is he a thing here? I just had to sneak some American history uh, in here, it is Thanksgiving at home, uh, but I'm with my B-Sides family, so I feel totally fine. Uh, but you know, I am gonna, to, to compensate for, for missing the holiday, I'm gonna have to sneak a little bit of uh, American history in here. So, if we are in the middle of the InfoSec revolution, which I do believe we are, that would make us and our community the revolutionaries. You might recognize some of the faces up here. Erica gets to be George Washington, because again, I am living in her house. Uh, so, if I'm thinking about what uh, these colonists needed to uh, win the Revolutionary War, in addition to the traditional cannons and muskets you might expect to see on the battlefield, there were also these dudes playing drums and flutes and stuff. So, I would assume that's part of the uh, battlefield communication system. I didn't do a lot of research into it, but it seems like a weird place for a jam sesh, so I'm gonna go with that. And likewise, I am here to suggest that communication can be a useful tool in our arsenal. We can treat communication like we treat any other focus area in security, whether that's sharpening our pen testing skills or our OSINT skills or learning a new coding language. It's, it's something that we tackle and we look at as another skill to master and we take seriously. So communication is admittedly a pretty broad subject. Uh, here's how I'm gonna approach it. As we move through this talk, we're gonna get increasingly nebulous and meta and weird. So maybe at the beginning, it seems like I'm giving you really straightforward, chill advice, uh, but your brain's gonna get super explodey by the end. Oh, there we go, yep. So we are going to be talking about communication strategies that affect our jobs, that's great. Our industry, that's even better. That's a whole bunch of people and also maybe our whole lives. We'll see, but I'm getting ahead of myself. It's still very early. That brain is barely on at all. It is not caffeinated. We're gonna start with something very simple. A problem that you may have noticed, 
and that is the Invisible InfoSec team. So a while back, I did a very unscientific survey where I asked as many people as I could from different industries and different sized companies about their experiences with their InfoSec teams. My goal was to look at successful interactions and unsuccessful interactions and use that information to create a sort of guide to outline how we can have uh, successful engagements with the rest of the organization. The result was that the vast majority of respondents had never interacted with their organization's information security team where they thought they hadn't. And some people who worked at really giant companies were totally adamant that they did not have a security team at all. Uh, fortunately, some light LinkedIn searching revealed that that was not the case. But we definitely have a visibility problem. So do you have goals that are tied to your performance review or maybe even your annual salary? Or maybe you just make goals because you want to improve yourself and your company, you weird nerd. Well, assuming you are suffering from invisible InfoSec team syndrome, maybe you'll want to make uh, increasing the quantity and quality of your communications with the rest of the organization one of your 2018 goals. So we'll go over some strategies you can implement. They're really easy, and they're easy to measure, too. Uh, you'll put them in place, and then you'll profit. Easy, easy three-step plan. So uh, I did, th this actually was part of the presentation that Erica saw. I did uh, present some of these ideas before, and when I suggested hanging out with coworkers in real life, I literally got booed. <laughs> <laughs> um, which I should have been ready for. I totally get that interacting with humans in meat space is bad sometimes. So we won't spend too much time on that. I will say, if it makes sense, based on your company culture and your company size and your budget, maybe it wouldn't be a bad idea to host an event or two. Uh, you know, people think of us as gatekeepers that they're scared of getting in trouble with. So uh, an event, and, and forming some trusted relationships really actually could go a long way in making your organization more secure. And again, while I personally think it's great that there really is a business purpose for the company to sponsor an InfoSec happy hour, I know that this isn't everyone's thing and there are plenty of other things that we can do. And the good thing about the rest of these is that they're very measurable, which again, we need to demonstrate success to get that bonus money, so. Uh, but we're gonna fly through these because I bet that you already have most of them in place, but I am thinking that maybe you'll hear one or two new things that you haven't implemented yet that you can put into place when you get back to the office. So buckle up, let's go. Number two, templates. Let's say you needed to send out a security alert uh, across your company or to a few people in your company right now. How many of you have a template show of hands that you would work from and, and send. That's a, a lot, bunch of light is all I really see, actually. <laughs> um, I'm gonna assume like some of you raised your hand. Uh, I mean, this also isn't part of everyone's job, but I do feel putting together a template is like kind of lame. But I feel really strongly that when we have templates for things like this, we're gonna send out more security alerts. We're gonna send out better security alerts because we're not gonna miss something. Uh, and we're going to be able to send them out faster, which often is, uh, time is really of the essence for things like that. Uh, if you're uh, thinking about what you would want to include in a template, I have this handy little guide that I like to keep at the bottom of mine, so I don't, for, I mean, these are really obvious questions, like you know these things, but it is just nice to remind yourself, I won't walk through all of them, but for example, uh, is feedback necessary? Reminding yourself, did if I'm sending out an announcement or a, a suggestion or you know rolling out a new project, did I explicitly ask for comments and questions and did I give them a channel through which to send those? So those are just handy reminders that I like to have. Documentation. What kind of things do you want your team, or not your team, your, the rest of your company reaching out to your team about? Definitely phishing, probably violations of any policies, like the acceptable use policy or whatever. 
And now think about whether the guidelines for how people should reach out to your team are super accessible and really visible and well known and well documented. Sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. But I would suggest that you know if you sent out a clear reminder linking to some clear documentation about how to report phishing attempts, your report numbers would spike way up. And that is a nice measurable stat you have right there. So onward and upward to demos. How do you make sure the rest of the organization has visibility into what you're doing? At Rapid7, the information security team reports into the products organization. We are an agile organization, and uh, a lot of our engineering teams have biweekly demos already. It makes sense for us to also have biweekly demos to show interested parties what we're working on. We're also a security team and a security company. You know, more people, you might not have the same level of interest. Maybe a newsletter or a blog update would make more sense for your team. Maybe an occasional lunch and learn, but it definitely is worth thinking about what you can do to increase the amount of visibility that other people have into your work. And let's talk about how you're using chat applications. This is my favorite one. So emailing a whole distribution list is kind of intimidating. I find emailing one person I don't know kind of intimidating. Email's weird. So it is great if we can be available on more casual channels like Slack or Skype or whatever you crazy kids are using, DMing each other and whatnot. So we have at Rapid7 private and public Slack channels, a uh, private channel, of course, to talk amongst our team, and a public channel so that people can come and go as they please and ask us questions and just discuss what's going on uh, in security. This is great for a lot of reasons. Sometimes people join with a question and they see their question has already been answered. My work is done. Sometimes people answer each other's questions and I just like get to sit back and watch it happen. Again, amazing, do my job for me, definitely. And uh, something that we weren't really planning on but uh, has been a huge resource is this group is made up of people from all across the organization, all of whom are interested in security in some way or another. So if you're rolling out a new project and you wanna sort of uh, get a temperature, get some early feedback on that, it's really a great place to start. It's a pretty engaged group, so it works really well for us. Monitoring for keywords. So, quick story, many moons ago, I went to another office. I <laughs> discovered that there was kind of a big miscommunication about a project that I was working on and responsible for making sure people knew about, oh no. Um, but I worked it out in person, not a big deal. Next thing I did was I set up a, uh, I monitored for the name of that project in our public Slack channels so that whenever people were talking about it, I could make sure that their questions were getting answered and they had all the up-to-date information. And I think that was a pretty good move. We also can integrate and automate. I mean, these are our favorite things to do, right? We can go above and beyond just monitoring for mentions and we can actually have Slack bots do our jobs for us. This is something my team is building out right now, hopefully by the end of this project. For example, if someone uses the phrase guest Wi-Fi, they'll get uh, a Slack bot linking them to the wiki page with the guest Wi-Fi information on it. So then they're not just getting the password, they're, they also have all the information about how we do and don't use guest Wi-Fi right at their fingertips. And I didn't have to do anything. That sounds amazing. I'm really trying to make myself irrelevant as quickly as I can. Uh, we can also use Slack bots for policy enforcement. For example, someone posts something that looks like a secret API key, they probably wanna know that they made a mistake. The Slack bot can be like, do you maybe wanna delete this? Uh, really helpful. So I think that Slack monitoring example really highlights we wanna be visible and we wanna be communicating with the rest of the organization. That doesn't mean we need to be in your face and disruptive. It just means that we want to be working alongside other teams consistently instead of, you know, just getting pulled in when there's a fire, which I'm sure you all know tends to happen pretty frequently. Of course, we're trying to get that bonus money, so we have to make sure these efforts are planned out and measured so we can really demonstrate success. 
And again, I'm not gonna talk to you all these poets, what? We don't have time for that. So I'm just gonna, I'll pick one example. I'll do, let's do uh, the Slack, the public Slack channel. So I wanna define what success looks like before I try this. What do I wanna get out of this group? I want to start with a pilot group. Maybe you wanna start with a few people that are invited to a public uh, security channel before you roll it out to the whole company. What worked and what didn't get feedback? I love a good survey. Just ask people how they felt about it. And of course, did we accomplish our goals? If you didn't, just go back to plan and do it again until you've got that sweet bonus cash. It's easy. Also, I mean, obviously this is a helpful process for anything, not just communication, like this is project management, right? But that's kind of the point. We should be approaching communication like anything else, like uh, rolling out new phishing drills or uh, implementing changes to our vulnerability management program. This is something that the more time and effort we put into it and the more structure we put around it, the more we're gonna get out of it. Oh, and by the way, doing all this stuff will be easier if you hire communicators. Okay, so you may have noticed that our brains are starting to do things now because we, you know, I mean, that was pretty straightforward, right? All the stuff that we can do in our job, it's easy peasy. You get the money, you go home, it's great. But now we are talking about using communication to address one of the most talked about issues in our industry. Mm. Ye old talent gap. InfoSec thought leaders love talking about the talent gap. It's a good one. Uh, I personally, as a self-appointed thought leader, um, <laughs> believe that we have a talent gap in part because we have a narrow understanding of what a security professional is. And I, you know, I'm saying we pretty loosey-goosey because I've met a whole bunch of you over the last week and a lot of you don't, but let me explain. So let's look at this very scientific graph. On our y-axis, we have tech skills. On our x-axis, we have communication skills. I'm gonna put a potato down here, just for reference. <laughs> it's not technical. I, it's not a very strong communicator. It's just a straight up potato. This is Robert Frost. I don't really know anything about his technical skills. This was a guess. I just, I literally Googled dead poet man. Um, <laughs> he died in 1963, so he probably wasn't like reverse engineering malware in his spare time. And then, oh, oh. <gasps> how did that go? Someone must have, I've been hacked. Um, but let's get serious. I have a teammate at Rapid7 named Justin Pagano, who is a super technical dude, and he's a great communicator. And since I'm saying so many nice things about him, I'm gonna use a really unflattering photo of him. <laughs> this is him after some sort of freaky mouth surgery. But, uh, you know, it would be great if we could all be in that top corner with Justin in his weird mouth. <laughs> but it's, I wish I had done a bigger version of it still. It's so terrifying. Like also this, even the under his eyes situation, it looks, his eyes look very dead. Okay, so, <laughs> um, <laughs> but it is okay that we are not all in that corner. That's why we work on teams. There are also plenty of security engineers who are amazing at their job and just not super strong communicators. And maybe they have no interest in becoming communication masters. And that is totally fine. But I think that they know it's fine. And I think this group is largely aware of the opportunities that exist for them in the security industry and you know they're getting hit up by recruiters and it's just well known that there's a lot of meaningful work that they can do without having communication be 75% of their job. What doesn't make sense to me is when we use these engineers who are few and far between and we really need to maximize their talent to implement things like security awareness training. But you know who might be good at something like that? Oh, it's your girl. <laughs> yes. This is about putting the right people in the right job. 
I am never going to be as technically gifted as a lot of the security engineers that I work with. And do not diagnose me with imposter syndrome. I am just, I, I'm calling it like it is. And I'm totally okay with that. Because, I, and also, I mean, don't get me wrong, like, I'm trying to get up there. I'm clawing my way up there a little bit every day, but I'm really not close yet. But there are things that I am good at. I am good at understanding the security controls in my organization and articulating those to customers so that they can feel confident when they hand over their critical data to us. I am good at understanding third-party risks, the risks that they're gonna bring into our environment, and working with business owners in my company to make sure that they understand how to engage with those third parties in a secure way. I am good at anticipating where data leakage might happen and getting in front of that. I am good at making sure our Vuln Disclosure program is working the way it's supposed to. And hopefully I will be a good manager. It is too soon to tell. Like, should I keep going? I, I d <laughs> have I convinced you guys I don't have imposter syndrome yet? I'm obsessed with myself. So <laughs> the, the real point is I'm not running out of work to do anytime soon. So why aren't there more people like me in InfoSec? I really think that they don't know these opportunities are out there. They don't know that a lot of the things I just described are part of this job. Basically, as soon as I knew the information security existed, I was obsessed with it. I loved how quickly the space was changing. I loved the idea of trying to stay one step ahead of someone or something that was out to get you. I have always loved the security community. It is such a unique and awesome and special group of humans. Uh, and despite all of this, when I met the person who is now my boss at a security conference a few years ago, uh, and he started talking about an open role on his team, I was almost adamant that I could not make meaningful contributions in that role. I was super stressed about not having the technical chops. I thought I was gonna be a huge burden to the team. Of course, I was not, and there was plenty of work for me to do. But my idea of what a security professional was, was so different from who I was that I just couldn't see it. So that's my personal experience, but I've got some stats to back me up too. This chart shows the disconnect between what members of the workforce think will make them successful and what hiring managers are actually looking for. The very top skill that is being prioritized by hiring managers is communication skills, very closely followed by analytical skills. Meanwhile, the workforce is prioritizing a slew of technical skills, which, you know, they're not irrelevant, they're important, we need them to do our jobs, but uh, th there's, there's clearly a disconnect in, uh, in where their focus needs to be. And yet, we are so quick to devalue anything that isn't a STEM degree. Do I want to be on a security program of 15 recent grads with sociology degrees? Like, no, but we do need to recognize that the best teams are diverse teams. It's also not a diverse team if you have 15 sociology majors. And, uh, and then once we have that diverse team, we put people in the roles where they can be doing the things that they're passionate about and really good at. I really think we can make a pretty big uh, dent in this talent gap by expanding where we are looking for talent and by being mindful of how people with different backgrounds can contribute to our team. Of course, getting people from unconventional backgrounds in the talent pipeline will also require educating people outside of our industry about what really goes into a comprehensive security program beyond the hacker in the hoodie. And I, honestly, I'm feeling kind of uncomfortable talking about my weak tech skills because I'm sure it makes me less credible as an information security professional to someone in this room or someone watching on YouTube, which it's like if you're on YouTube, like, pff, fight me. I don't know, you troll. <laughs> um, but <laughs> don't fight me if you're here in real life. Um, but I also know that I really love my job and the industry needs more people to do my job. So if I can help someone feel a little less uncomfortable 
wandering into the security world, then that would be cool. So let's welcome communicators into our industry and close that talent gap. It's closed, we did it, yeah. <laughs> This is such a weird slide for anyone to clap at. It's like, okay. Um, so, uh, but okay, guys, like that was cool. Everyone's brain seems really on, right? That was good. Um, we did, th there, were th there were three phases though. We only got into the middle one. So we have to keep going. What could possibly be more brain explodey than closing the talent gap? Mind control, you guys. <laughs> We're on it, we're doing this. So uh, Claire Tills is a, uh, she has an awesome blog. She has a background in crisis communication and PR, and she looks at a whole slew of InfoSec subjects through a social sciences lens. And what I've really appreciated is her ability to explain why we need to move InfoSec communication into a more uh, a positive and proactive uh, framework. I, I mean, you know, it's one like people tell us to be positive, but like, why? Show me some stats. Claire's showing us some stats. In a 1999 study, beachgoers were presented with informational pamphlets, and then they were given a coupon for free sunscreen. Those who read the pamphlets focused on the benefits of wearing sunscreen were more likely to use the coupon than those who were. Uh, given pamphlets about all the horrible things that were going to happen if they didn't wear sunscreen. So there's a whole bunch of studies like this, but the real takeaway is we know the consequences of ignoring security hygiene can be really bad. But when we have the opportunity to do so, let's focus on the positives and make sure that people feel good about interacting with us and interacting with these subjects. We uh, at Rapid7 are building some security awareness training right now, and it is really tempting to try to just scare people with all of the things that could happen if they aren't diligent, because we are projecting and we are scared. <laughs> but there really is plenty that people can gain by following security best practices. These are some of Clara's ideas. I'm sure you can think of a bunch more. And while we're on this positivity kick, let's talk about Eliminating blame language. Oh yeah, someone's into this. <laughs> okay, so, so I first came across this topic in a blog post by Jacob kaplan Moss from last year. <laughs> also, I totally realize that at this point I'm just reading other people's blogs to you, but like, they're not here and I am, so. Uh, <laughs> Uh, they're busy. So Jacob explored the uh, blameful culture in InfoSec that focuses on individual failures instead of systemic problems. So to give an example of what that looks like, let's say an employee clicks a link he's not supposed to. The blame-focused security team chalks that up to a bad apple. Maybe they even get sassy with the user. And this creates two problems. One, that user had a crappy experience with us, probably less likely to report an incident again if it happens. And two, maybe even more importantly, we didn't force ourselves to explore why the incident really happened. So we might have missed an opportunity to fix a systemic problem. Instead of looking for a person to blame, we probably need to team up with this user and uh, zoom out and identify how this issue slipped through the cracks. In this example, we could consider if we're doing enough end user training or if we need to change our email filters, et cetera. If the only available vocabulary assumes that someone is good and someone is bad when we're framing the conversation like that, we create opposing sides. Instead, we need to approach every incident with this new mindset something bad happened to us, and we need to figure out how to fix it moving forward. This is the same reason we don't, do, uh, we don't include names when we're doing a root cause analysis, of course. And you know, what I'm really trying to say is, don't get blame, get solutions. <laughs> they loved it. <laughs> Okay, we'll move along. Um, thank you guys so much for laughing at that. Because I was gonna just, I was going to do this until it happened and it wasn't that long. 
Um, we're moving on, though, to another wild strategy. <laughs> Listening. Oh my god, it's crazy. Um, this one maybe isn't mind-blowing, but it's definitely as much a part of effective communication as anything else in this presentation. And if we do it well, it can definitely impact our jobs and our industry and definitely our whole lives. So we can start by holding up weird question marks and thinking really hard about them. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Isn't this so funny? <laughs> I literally Googled it, like, asking questions. Like, who are stock photo people? Um, so we can start by asking more questions and really listening to the responses instead of waiting for our turn to talk, something that I have a problem with. Um, but I'm working on it. Obviously, you know this stuff at a high level, but it really never hurts to have a reminder. I definitely need a reminder every once in a while. Um, it's especially great to hear it at the beginning of a two-day conference. And it's great to hear right before the holidays when we're going to have to be around our families for a whole bunch of time. So let's, uh, let's do an, another hypothetical situation. Someone is just, maybe it's someone in your family, is adamant about not needing to use MFA. This is definitely something that could maybe trigger me. But what I'm going to try next time is asking questions. Maybe they will talk through it, and they will lead themselves to what you think is the right solution. Or maybe you will learn something about them, and you'll see that their risk profile is just different than yours, and that's the right answer for them. But they're wrong, and they should definitely use MFA. People just don't like to be told what to do. And by asking questions like, well, what's the worst thing that could happen if someone got into your email account? What other accounts do you have tied to that? Who could they reach out to? How long do you think it takes to set up MFA? That last one was maybe sassy, but um, you can probably get someone to think that setting it up was their idea. More of this mind control stuff. But we're not just using listening as yet another tactic for, for Claire's mind control. We have a lot to gain ourselves from getting good at listening. You know, while we're out here networking, let's not forget this quote from Calvin Coolidge, 30th president of the United States. I literally don't even know if that's him. There were like, I don't I mean, maybe he aged really weirdly, but I Google searched him and it looked like 18 different men. Um, <laughs> But like, I just liked the way that the background looked. Um, and OK, so whatever. That was a helpful quote. It was cool. Uh, he probably didn't even say it. Um, <laughs> let's, let's revisit the parable of the ox. Now I'm doubting if this even happened. Did this even happen? Is history even real? This one, I think, happened. At a fair in 1906, more, like, people are always misattributing quotes, you know? Like, at Marilyn Monroe said everything. Like, OK, so at a fair in 1906, more than 800 people tried to accurately guess the weight of an ox. Well, no one guessed the right weight. The average of all the guesses was within 0.8% of the ox's actual weight. That is insanely accurate. The more opinions you get, the more likely you are to come to the right answer. Listening is dope. And we have so much to learn from each other. That is one of the reasons that B-Sides has been so successful globally. And speaking of learning from each other, before I wrap this up, I do need to say thank you to two people who took time out of their very American holidays to give me much needed feedback on this presentation yesterday. So thanks. I know like in the grand scheme of things, like comparing B-Sides world domination to this, like B-Sides is maybe a better example of learning from each other. And this one's just me procrastinating. But I had to say thank you. There it is. Um, <laughs> but like, OK. Like, we're going to do the thing now. I'm really excited to learn from you guys over the next two days and listen. And if it seems like I'm not listening, just, like, remind me. To, if it seems like maybe I'm just waiting, just waiting to say something, just remind me that listening is really dope. Do you guys, like, feel ready to be sides now? Yay! <laughs> Thanks, guys. New Zealand rules.